Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. I am joined today by Diana Larson and Diana has spoken at a number of different testing conferences including the upcoming Agile Testing Days where she'll be presenting a keynote. She's also um, wrote a number of testing books such as Lift Off, Start and Sustain Successful Teams which I believe is the, the title of her keynote at Agile Testing Days and she's also produced um, Agile Retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great, and Five Rules of Accelerated Learning. And today, Diana is going to talk to you about testers and teams on the Agile Fluency journey. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask Diana, uh, please type them into the questions field there on your control panel. And at the very end of the webinar, we will go through your questions one by one. So now let me hand you over to today's presenter, Diana. Hello, Diana. Good morning. How are you this morning? Oops, let's uh, get it to start with the slideshow. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be here and so happy to talk about with you about the specific role of testers um, in the Agile fluency journey. And I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about um, the Agile fluency model and, and how we think of it and what it does. And, and, then, um, and then talk about how testers fit in on this journey of the development teams. So the Agile Fluency model was, was uh, developed by James Shore and myself a number of years ago. Um, we were disturbed by the fact that we kept hearing about um, people in the, in the Agile community saying that, you know, you either Agile or you're not uh, particularly, and uh, the, the disturbing um, uh, the stories that we were hearing about mixed expectations, uh, people were expecting to get one thing from their Agile transition and discovered that they didn't get that at all and, and were disappointed by that. And uh, Jim and I would work a lot with teams in, in a variety of organizations and what we were noticing is that Agile really, that Agile adoption, that Agile influence, didn't actually need to look the same uh, for every team in every organization. And so we set out to create a model. We vetted it with the community. Eventually, uh, Martin Fowler uh, uh, posted an article that we wrote about the, the model on his website, and he has been also very generous in supporting the adoption of this model around the world. What we wanted to do with this model was make sure that it was, um, that it was valuable, that every, every different way that Agile was being used that we were describing had value for that team and that organization. We didn't want to you know, be heading people down the wrong path, and so we definitely wanted it to be a positive model. We wanted it to promote improvement. Um, as people move in, to different places in the model, they get different benefits. Not all those benefits are desirable or even apply in every organization, but depending on where you are in the model, um, you may learn about new possibilities for your teams and your organizations. And finally, it's an inclusive model. Um, any and all methods and frameworks can get you there. We are not, we are very much methodology agnostic. We, um, we don't feel that one method or another method has necessarily uh, any edge on the others, but that each one has its own place and the, and the important thing is to find the one that is the best fit for you and your team. So with those things in mind, we created our model. And the model is based on this idea of 
fluency. Um, we, it, we came to it because we had been uh, doing some work together and got to kind of a frustrating place in our work and, and uh, as you do when you're collaborating and you get to some place frustrating, you, we sort of started on a tangent conversation. And that conversation um, was primarily about some, uh, some things that we had been learning about language fluency. And then that created a spark in us, and we realized that we could talk about fluency in Agile in much the same way that we thought about fluency with languages. In other words, how, what is our skill level? How, what can we do automatically without thinking? When someone says, oh, are you fluent in that language? Generally speaking, that's what they're referring to. What do you do, what, how can you speak without thinking? So what skills, what agile skills do you have that the team applies without really thinking about it? Routinely, smoothly, skillfully, um, and with ease. The other thing about fluency is that it really has to do with the practical application of a set of skills or a theory base around skills. And it results in an investment in learning. You don't become fluent without making some investment in deliberate practice and in really partnering that practice with um, solid understanding of why you're doing it, which is the theory. So those things together brought us to this Agile Fluency model, or we sometimes call it the Agile Fluency Pathway. Sometimes it's the journey. Um, sometimes we refer to it, and as I'm going to do here, as, a, as if we were on a bus trip. So the, oops, sorry about that. Uh, the, um, it has four ways of, it describes four general ways of moving in the Agile space. Each of these ways we have seen um, organizations and teams applying, um, and sometimes they are perfectly suited to what that organization needs. In other times, they're not quite suited, and the organization and the team really need to move to a different place along the pathway. And so I'm going to describe that pathway and those places, and. Um, and help you, and as we go along, I'd like you to be thinking about where do you think your team is functioning right now, if you have an Agile team, and whether you have an Agile team or not, where would your organization that most benefit if your team were functioning? How, where is the right place for you? What is your best fit on this pathway or on this journey? So we, we talk about it as, a, uh, as, a, as if, we, if it were bus zones. If you look at the white bus zone and the green bus zone and the yellow zone here on this slide, we start in the center and you know, what we want to do is to get from Piccadilly Circus to Russell Square, but you know, we staying in that first zone, zone number one, makes the most sense. However, if where we really wanted to get to was Kensington and, uh, or Ealing, <laughs> then you know, we need to travel further and we need to probably invest more to get further. Uh, usually the tickets cost more for that. The way we think about this is that the, the um, team both rides and drives the bus uh, or the metro system, wherever you're going. However, the organization has to buy the ticket. The organization decides what benefit, where do we need this team to go in, this, in our journey, and, and then makes the investment to buy those tickets. So, and then the team gets themselves there. The, the, the model has a, uh, goes through this journey in a very predictable way. What we have learned is that in any 
um, development of fluency, whether it's the team or an individual becoming skill, skilled in a language, we tend to go through a predictable, uh, a predictable pathway to that skill level. Now, the, that causes people to tell us, oh, isn't this a maturity model? And it really isn't, because what we know is that depending on what level of skill you need, just like where you need to go on the bus, you may not need to, to go beyond that. Um, you may only need to focus on value or deliver value uh, or optimize value. You, you may not need to go further. The, the point is in the discernment about what does my team really need. So as the team's getting on the bus and, um, and there is management over on the right-hand side buying the ticket so that we can go. So at the start, we assume um, that you have, this, beginning our journey, we assume that you have a group of skilled individuals who actually are, who are doing some delivery of software. They, they know how to do that. They have the tools and the resources to develop the product they're working on. They're probably working as individual contributors um, and then you know, having the, the difficult job of, of uh, consolidating and integrating the various pieces that they're working on at some point and then the, doing a release or uh, an actual delivery and the software is going out the door. If we don't have people who actually can do the job, but we're still lacking in those really basic programming skills and testing skills, we probably need to stop there and make sure that we have a group of people who can do those things. Um, but we're going to go on our journey assuming we've got a, a skilled group of individuals who, who know what they're doing. And we have realized that the best way to, uh, the, for them to provide value to the organization, to them to get benefit, for the organization to get benefit, most benefit from their work is to move to this zone of focus on value. In focus on value, everyone can see progress from a business perspective. So the team is tracking its work. It is, um, you know, with the help of a coach or a scrum master or, or some other person, um, and making sure that that work is visible, that, it's, that, they're, that the work that they are doing is transparent, that it is visible someplace, whether in the team room, on a physical task board, or um, online in, a, in some kind of an online tool or electronic tool. And the reason that that visibility is important is that as we learn new things about the product, about what we're building, about what the customer needs, the business can redirect the team if needed. They can say, you know, yes, you know, finish up on this feature, but don't start that one we had planned. Start this other feature because that's going to give the customer more, more value and make the customer more interested in giving value to the business. So um, we want to be able to have that ability to redirect the team when needed. The, uh, the other part of focus on value is that it means that the team is shifting from where it may have been in that, in that starting place of primarily working on the things that seemed most technically interesting or, you know, had the most, um, had the highest coolness factor, you know, allowed, allowed me to, to play around with new languages or something that I'm interested in. It really shifts that perspective to what's going to give value to our customer and beginning to build through that lens. And so there's a, a close relationship with a product owner or product manager, the people who are sometimes what we call the business liaison, the people who are communicating with the customer and communicating where the most value will be to the team. And um, then the team accepting that that's 
that's what they want to work on and that was their, will be their next job. So on the team, the team is um, gaining team success over individual success. We are shifting to much more of a team culture um, as opposed to that sort of collection of individual uh, contributor culture. So the team needs to learn to um, more agile project and work management. They may need to develop much more of a, a consistent workflow that they follow. Um, they will receive coaching and training in how to work as a team and how to stick with that, with those workflows and, the, and the managing the work system. Very much focused there. The role of testing here is to help uh, the product folks write the acceptance test so the teams can know what value looks like uh, when there is a when they are presented with a story a chunk of work to be done how will they know when that is going to be valuable so testing also needs to be in the workflow testing needs to be included in the definition of done and uh, testers may also work closely with the team to look for what tests can be automated? And so uh, very often acceptance tests can be automated and what other testing can be automated to make sure that the team is delivering the value that they expect to deliver. At the same time, the organization is, is undergoing some shifts to thinking in terms of a team culture as well. The managers are learning to manage teams instead of individuals and are dedicating team members to the team. Uh, ideally, that team is co-located. If it's not co-located, if it's more geographically distributed, then they are providing the, the electronic tools and communication systems and things to, to help that team get as close to behaving as a co-located team as possible. Um, and there's a product owner who is available to the team that can help translate that idea of customer value. Um, the organization begins to look at what is happening uh, in its policies and procedures that create disincentives to the team working well together, and they start focusing on removing the impediments that uh, arise that get in the way of the team being successful and focusing on value and always delivering the next most valuable thing to the organization and the customer. For many organizations, focus on value is exactly where they need to be. Um, as a matter of fact, we have identified through polling and a number of other means that about mm, 40%, maybe 40 even to 50% of teams, this is their sweet spot. This is the kind of agile fluency they need, the, the fluent agile approaches that they need, where they need to develop fluency in their practice. Um, we, um, I've, I've worked uh, with an organization, it was a pu large public utility, and they had their their whole um, IT organization was really in disarray. They did a pilot uh, project that where they had some really good results from installing Scrum and then decided that they wanted to shift the, all of their IT software development and configuration management to, um, to that same approach. And when they got there, when those teams were reliably always delivering the next most valuable thing to their primarily internal customers at that point, the, the organization was thrilled. That was such an improvement over what they had had before. They were very happy that their teams could do that. This was really a sweet spot for them. But not every organization can be satisfied with that. And so for some organizations, we move to the next zone. We drive to the next, uh, or we ride the bus to the next zone. And this zone is called deliver value. 
in deliver value, teams now need to not only be able to work according to what that is the next most valuable thing, but also ship bundles of that in such a way that the market can consume them and wants to consume them and is and has the capability of consuming them. So, for example, um, many many teams that are developing web services. Uh, might be, might need to deliver multiple times a day. I mean, we many of us have heard the story of uh, Flickr that was was releasing onto the website new functionality, you know, 14, 15 times a day. In other instances, that market cadence might be monthly or quarterly or even longer than that. I at one point worked with a, an organization that was. Uh, putting building software that was embedded in medical devices and those had to go through regulatory approval and so on and that market could only uh, consume their deliverables about once every year and a half. So here it's very important to know what really is your market cadence and the more frequently your customers can accept new value and are willing to pay for new value or, or give value in return for it, uh, the more important is that your team can have this level of fluency. So um, the other thing that happens here is that we have to, the team learns to reveal obstructions early. We have to be able to see early on where there are defects, where uh, things are getting in the way of that value delivery. That become that that is has heightened importance in deliver value. So here, teams have to become really quite skilled in their agile engineering practices. They um, we here's where things like software craftsmanship or extreme programming engineering practices or those kinds of things uh, gain attention and gain value. And so the team now is um, studying and practicing agile engineering techniques. They are thinking about new ways of doing work, sharing, shared ownership of the code, uh, shared common coding standards, pair programming, no bugs, uh, the more in this instance, the more bugs get released, then the more time the team is spending on fixing those bugs rather than delivering new values. So we really want to make sure they're spending as most of their time working on new features that are going to deliver new value and little time fix on hot fixes. They are also uh, learning to cross-train and beginning to think about the idea of generalizing specialists that we're going to see in the testing part. So testers here are now moving into being part of a cross-functional team where in focus on value the testing may have not been embedded in the team but um, just needed to work closely with the team, had, had maybe had a dedicated person who worked closely with the team. Now, now they are actually part of the team. Um, they, and they may be stretching into becoming generalizing specialists. Maybe, some, maybe they spend most of their time uh, working on tests, but they may also be working with the product owner to help uh, groom the backlog and, and even more uh, than just uh, before where they were helping to write acceptance tests, they may take on a greater role there. Or they may be working with developers to help them improve their skill at testing and, and broadening the ideas of that. Here the, te the testing takes a, an exploratory approach moving away from just focus on script, you know, automating scripted tests or those kinds of things, but actually looking out ahead to what might be um, the next bump in the road that the, the customer is going to bump into and, and does our product accommodate that and more of those kinds of things. 
And this focus on quality here, uh, as I was saying, with uh, no defects or no bugs, keeping that focus on very high quality is an enabler of those engineering practices of continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery. So we are looking for the testers getting involved there as well and making sure that um, we are that bugs are not getting and defects are not getting released into production. The organization at the same time, um, when people are learning these new agile engineering practices, very often there may be a dip in productivity as part of that learning curve. And so the organization is taking a deep breath and having the, the patience to help to allow the team to address issues around technical debt and issues around new new practice learning and so on. At this point, technical disciplines are going to be um, much more uh, embedded in the team. So we are looking at, as we said, QA and test. Maybe DevOps becomes an issue here, depending on the nature of the product. Or UX gets a, a closer relationship with the team. Um, also, we might have agile programmers um, embedded in the um, with with the actual customers. We we um, were talking with a person who in Seattle who her teams were uh, writing software and delivering software for people who do who do market trading and um, like in the economic markets. And they actually moved their teams next to the traders that they were most creating uh, most creating their um, their product for, and so that they were you know they could very, very quickly if they had questions they could ask their actual users and um, and so on, and you know the organization has to be able to accept the counterintuitive idea that um, you know maybe slowing down is going to help them speed up uh, the Japanese. Actually, there are many, uh, many sayings around the world. Japanese have a saying, uh, go slow to go fast. Um, I know in the US, we sometimes say haste makes waste. This idea that by slowing down in the beginning and learning things well and becoming uh, really skilled and very fluent at these engineering skills, pays off to us in many ways later on. So for another maybe 25 or 30 percent of teams, according to our polling, this deliver value is exactly the right place, exactly the bundle of benefits that the organization needs for them. In other instances, if they're not there yet, they, there is more that the organization needs from the team than can be gotten here and can, or can be delivered here. And so the team moves on. To, now we're moving into the first two uh, places on this pathway, focused primarily on what was going on in the team, and the organization had to create some support structures for that. There's some supporting processes and procedures for that, but didn't necessarily have to change how they were as an organization. Here we're going to see some different changes. So at optimized value, the idea is that the team can make excellent product decisions. The team now knows enough about what, what the customers want that they may even be able to anticipate how new technologies built into their existing product might help their customers in ways that the customer hadn't even thought of yet. So here is where we may get some um, ideas around disruptive innovation and uh, ways that, that the team can produce things that may be unexpected. 
to do that, there, we have to eliminate handoffs, and we need very fast decision making so that we can't be waiting around for, um, you know, well, getting permission from somewhere else in the organization. And so de decision making about the product are, is more embedded in the team here. Maybe not 100%, but much more embedded in the team. And the dependencies between products and between teams have been radically reduced or even uh, eliminated so that all the every team is doing a whole piece of work and can make decisions about that very rapidly. So the team is going to need to be uh, patient with the rest of the organization while some of those other kinds of changes happen. Um, the, they will build trust by their consistency of delivery that the, that the organization can they're going to show the organization that it can, the rest of the organization, that they can be relied on to make the right choices to uh, create the new ideas that, you know, do the kind of design thinking that is going to help. Uh, to do, the team has to understand the nature of the business and the customer. They have to move beyond their focus, their technical focus, and encompass some broader learning. It, the role of testing here is to help the team in that, in that uh, endeavor, learning more and more and being, being able to communicate desired business outcomes as well as desired customer quality outcomes. And, uh, you know, being kind of in the customer's mind so that you can see through their eyes. Again, working to market cadence, that has to happen as well. But an even increased emphasis on exploratory testing, what is out there. Um, this may be either in deliver value or in optimize value may be where you start looking at uh, behavior-driven development. Um, how, you know, what are, the, what are the scenarios that our customer is uh, working in and how does that help us um, decide our given win-wins and so on. The organization has a big job here because they are undergoing some structure shifts. Um, they are making sure that every team has business expertise embedded in its membership. So that may be a full-time product owner or product manager or in the team, or it may be that some team members, some technical team members are developing that business expertise. Um, it different, there are different solutions there depending in different organizations. Very much putting together product market focused teams. Um, transferring responsibility for budgets and planning to the team so that they know how that is working. And here we may see a shift in management structure as well and moving more to cross-functional management teams who are rigorously focused on removing the, any impediments that are in the way of the teams doing the kind of uh, either lean startup or design thinking or you know, whatever approaches they're going to need here. The t management teams are going to be thinking more in a lean kind of way. And uh, the organization is going to judge the outcomes and the outputs of these teams much more on results than on adherence to plan. Oh, well, I'll just go back there for a moment. Um, an example here uh, might be useful. In uh, very often we are asked uh, where certain organizations that have a very high profile where they are in this model. How are they working in this model? And I think it's useful. I think Spotify is one that a lot of people know about. And, and we've talked to the uh, managers and, and coaches at Spotify. And they say, yes, Spotify, in fact, has optimized value teams. They, val they are, <laughs> are very valuable to them. Uh, it's helped them capture market. 
And so they have structured themselves so that they can support those optimized value teams. However, they also say that there are still some teams in their organizations that are working at focus on value or, and or delivering value. And because those are the benefits that Spotify needs from those teams. So that even within one organization, it's not one size fits all. It's not that all teams in an organization, unless the organization is very small and maybe only has a couple of teams. But once, once organizations begin to grow, they may have teams that need to work at various levels. And so that needs to be our various bus zones. And so that needs to be uh, assessed on a team by team basis. What, what real benefits do we need for this team? And then finally, the last, the last stop so far in our model. We have begun to see that there may be another bus zone, so to speak, uh, beyond this. But for now, there are so few uh, teams that are working at this. We, we've sort of stopped the model here for the time being. And this we call Optimize for Systems. This is where um, the the teams are actually stimulating innovation and disruption beyond their own organization. They, they look to optimize the value stream across the whole organization. They may be inventing new markets. They may be supporting new organizations. We've seen a few, um, a few teams that are working here that are uh, where their organization has uh, created an incubator for startups and and those teams may be in, interacting with and helping those startups uh, inside to uh, become you know to grow their skills and their um, and their uh, presence in the market so different kinds of things that are happening here uh, when we have there are so few here. Uh, it seems like right now less than maybe 2% of teams. It's, it, it seems to be a pretty small number at this point as far as we can tell. So when we are working in organizations, we don't spend a lot of time um, focused here. And the other reason we don't spend a lot of time focused here is that very often teams in this that have driven themselves to this zone no longer need as much outside coaching or um, outside consulting and their organizations have become very savvy to uh, the things they need to do to move forward and so they may be looking for expertise in other areas. So uh, I think those of us who are in coaching roles and stuff don't get to see these organizations at quite as often. So now that we've, we've gone through, I'd like you to think for a moment about what fluency zone your team is working in now and where does testing fit in that? What zone of benefits does your organization need from your team? So is the zone where your team is working now, is that, is that a match to the zone of the benefits that your organization needs? One of the things that we're doing now at the Agile Fluency Project is um, we had so many questions about this that a, a couple of years ago we developed a diagnostic. And so now we are taking that diagnostic into organizations so that teams can self-assess where they are. It's not some outsider coming in and you know, observing the team like a group of monk code monkeys right? and then telling them where they are, but, but the team actually does the assessment themselves. We have a, a very simple way for them to do that. And then we talk to the organization at the, in parallel about what benefits do you need. And then we match that team self-assessment outcome to the benefits the organization believes they need and then that help that organization then understand what kind of investment that
that will take to get those benefits. We, we in always invite the organization to invest right at their learning threshold. What, where, uh, what is the team, what, what fluency does the team need to develop next? What practices need, are they most in need of? What is right there? It's not, it may be um, reinforcing something that the, some practice that the team has just been stretching kind of into, doesn't do yet with routine, skillful, fluent ease, right? But, but it's getting there and so we may want to invest more in that or we may want to invest in the very next practice that's coming after that um, and creating opportunities for practice, for people to um, really try out those skills. As our, uh, my colleague Woody Zool sometimes says, you have to do the thing to learn the thing. Uh, which means, of course, that the first time, the first few times you're doing it, you're not going to do it as well as you will after a period of practice. So again, the organization needs to have the investment um, the, maybe the dollar investment to bring in training or uh, mentoring or those kinds of things or new equipment, um, but also the, uh, a time investment while those practice fluencies are, and proficiencies are being developed. Wherever your organization uh, needs to gain benefit, we believe that it's important to what we what Jim says all the time is call your shot. Decide what benefit you need. Do you need focus on value benefits? Do you need deliver value benefits? Do you need optimize for value benefits? And then introduce the team to all the things and the organization to all the things that they're going to need to do to um, accomplish that, to gain those benefits. And what we have seen is the, that fluent proficiency will be gained roughly in the uh, progression that we have um, outlined in our model. So then the question becomes, what investment will you need to make to help testing and teams reach a benefit zone that your organization needs and wants? And does your organization have the will to make those investments? And this is a very hard question. I, I sat with a group of managers um, not too long ago who, where one of the managers says, oh, we want to be optimized for systems. We want to be optimized for systems. And the QA manager said, and very rightly, given the, definition, the nature of their product, said, wait, wait a minute. We don't have the... Um, we don't have the bandwidth to invest there. We need to get very solid at deliver on value. That's where we need. We need to get our defect count down. We need to spend more time on building features and less time on, on hot fixes. We need to give uh, our investment right there. And when we get solid there, then we can think about something else. But we just don't have the money, the time, or the bandwidth to be able to do more than that. And so they had a very interesting conversation about, you know, what, what the various managers, um, what their aspirations were for their teams and their organizations and what they could realistically invest in right at that time. So the message here really is uh, grow the teams you need to get the delivery outcomes you want. And I just invite all of you to think clearly about that and take the next steps on your Agile fluency journey. And the best way to do that is to get in touch with us at the Agile Fluency Project. Uh, which you can find at agilefluency.org and I would be delighted to spend the next several minutes answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tayana, for that presentation. I'm going to open up my screen here again and just uh, tell our attendees a little bit more about some more 
webinars we have coming up and then we'll have a look at those questions. So let me just um, begin here with a look at a webinar taking place next week with James Lindsay. And for those of you who have attended the Eurostar conference, you've more than likely visited the test lab. Well, now we have an online version of the test lab where we set out a monthly challenge. And if you'd like to, to take part in these challenges, you can do so. Um, over on Test Huddle, there's a link there to this webinar. We have some more webinars coming up next month, and we had an ebook with Dave Hefner called The Selenium Guide, which was hugely popular. So Dave has come, decided to come back and do a webinar with us on how to use Selenium successfully. And Janet Gregory is going to present a webinar on do we need testers on Agile Teams. And Alexandra Stadebeck is going to talk to you about growing a company test community, roles and paths for testers. And all the information you'll need about these um, various webinars you can, be found, can be found over on Test Huddle. So just head over to Test Huddle and click on the upcoming webinars. So let's have a look down at some of the questions. Oh, sorry, there's one other slide here I have here. Um, our, our conference is taking place in just 12 days time and there's still opportunities for you to make, dis, make discounts on your purchases by availing of a group discount where you get five tickets for the price of four. So you'll find all the information on that over on the Eurostar website. And now, finally, we'll get to uh, some of your questions here. The first question I have, Diana, says, uh, is the fluency model always linear? Could you approach the team transformation and organizational transformation concurrently? Uh, well, yes, and it depends on where your organization is right at the moment. But definitely, I mean, as you could tell in the model, the um, there are organizational implications at, in in every one of these kinds of agile fluency. Um, and or every of uh, these bundles, Jim calls them bundles of, that, of fluent proficiency. And so there are organizational implications to every one of those. And um, one of the things I've noticed in a lot of agile transitions is the transition starts in the team as opposed to starting with those folks in the organization who are going to need to be who are going to need to know how to support those teams. So, even at, at focus on value, for instance, um, you know, if managers are in the mode of treating team members as individual contributors, that's going to be counterproductive. So both of those things need to be worked on in parallel. And, um, and as a matter of fact, product management as well uh, falls into that. There's going to need to be some real uh, some very different thinking in terms of product management about what the relationship is with the teams and how that works and so yes there are a number of organizational implications and it's best if those are worked on in parallel or even worked on in the organization a little ahead of where the team needs to be so that you're always uh, pushing the organizations uh, fluent proficiency in, in supporting these teams uh, a little ahead of where the teams actually are going to be in their next step. Did that, I want to make sure that answered the question. We have a number of people as well here, Diana, who are mm -hmm. just um, complimenting you on your, your presentation style here. There's oh, one of our, <laughs> they, they love the slides and everything. Um, one, one of our attendees here said a very interesting presentation and as graphic recording and sketch noting is my hobby, I like very much your visual style of your presentation and it reminds him of the books and the back of the napkin and uh, presentation mm -hmm. Zen. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you're familiar with these, these uh, publications, yeah. Diana, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and actually I need to give credit to my colleague uh, Adam Light, who works with me in the Agile Fluency Project, these uh, m many of these slides were primarily created by him, and I just made adjustments to them for the purposes of this of this webinar. Um, but uh, yes, we have a great team at the Agile Fluency Project, and I 
I feel well supported by them because I think they look really great too. <laughs> so, but I can't take credit for them. There's also a lot of people there as well asking, is this webinar recorded? And the answer is yes, we record all of our webinars and you'll be able to look at this webinar as well as the, the, the slides over on Test Huddle. And uh, you'll get an automated email shortly after this webinar is finished and it'll give you the link that'll bring you right through to the um, resource page. Um, as it stands right now, Dan, I don't see any other, other questions coming in. Um, just a number of people just thanking you as well and I want to thank you myself for, for taking the time out today. Uh, I think we're just going to leave it at that and thank all of our attendees for, for taking the time out to attend this, this presentation and that's it. Take care everyone and we hope to see you at future webinars. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dara.